Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Hunter Ohanian from the Stonewall National Museum and Archives here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and we're very happy to have all of you here. And uh, this is part of a series that we started in the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, crisis pandemic here in the United States and around the world, and it's a series of virtual programming. Tonight, we're happy to do something which is a new experiment. Uh, this is the first time we are tape recording uh, something. All the other talks have been live, but this one will be taped because we are very pleased to have a tour of the Tom of Finland exhibition in Berlin. And so everyone say hello to my friend, Misha. Misha, how are you? Hi, Hunter. Nice to see you. And Hi. greetings from Berlin. Yes, it's so you? wonderful. It's I'm wonderful. Thank you. It's wonderful to see you here in Ber Berlin. Um, Misha Goransky is the former creative director for Bruno Gramunder Books, uh, and he has many, many books under his belt, and he certainly knows a tremendous amount, amount about gay art. And he and I have worked on a number of projects together. And so I thought, who better to give us a tour of the Tom of Finland show at the Gallery Judah in Ber Berlin. And so thank you, Misha, for d doing this for everybody. Oh, I have to thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to show you and uh, your visitors all uh, this exhibition that was open during the Corona pandemic. So there were not a lot of people able to visit it. So I'm very happy to show you around today. So in the moment, we are standing here um, a little bit away from, from the street, um, in a, behind, uh, behind uh, the houses from the street, in front of Galerie Judin, as you already said. And I'm very happy that we have access today because it's Monday. Usually the galleries on Monday are closed, but for us, they opened today. So let's go in. So just to give just to give people just a little bit of background about Finland, of course, if you don't know him, he certainly is an American gay icon. He was an artist who lived between 1920 and 1991. And when he was 37 years old, he worked uh, for the first time for Bob Miser at Physique Pictorial. And here's the very first cover of Tom of Finland on Physique Pictorial. And it's believed that Bob Miser actually gave him the nickname Tom of Finland. He was of Finnish descent, and even at one point, the country of Finland had a U had a postage stamp in his honor. That's totally correct. What uh, what you just said. It was Bob Meiser um, and his Physik Pictorial, where he came up, where this name came up. At this time, it was typical uh, that you use not your real name um, when it came when you had something to do with erotic, especially homoerotic uh, art. So, um, but this exhibition here um, is about the relationship that Tom of Finland had with Hamburg, the city in Berlin that also has the first and only official bar that is called Tom's Bar. Or, uh, like, like you know, maybe no. Here in Berlin, we also have a Tom's Bar, but uh, the bar in Hamburg is definitely named after Tom of Finland. So this exhibition is about his relationship, because very important people in his life came from Hamburg, who were able to make him the artist he is today. So I want to give you a little impression here about the exhibition and i hope it works do you see something because oh yes it's a unbelievable that giant image is really just too much <laughs> i'm happy to say that when i came here the first the first time a few weeks ago um, i was really impressed about the quality of uh, the exhibition space and how they did everything here. The exhibition is going over two big rooms and is showing, as I said, the relationship um, that Tom has or had, in that case, had with Hamburg. Um, I just give you a little peek into the second room so that you know what you can expect from the next hour. 
So. Misha, Misha, is it true that Tom's first museum exhibition was in in Hamburg, Germany in 1976? Yes, yes. And this is also shown here as the first exhibition. The first exhibition took place, just a moment, I have to look that you can see everything. Um, like this. <laughs> Okay, it's a little bit because I do not really see what you see, so I have to look from the side. I hope it works for you. The first exhibition took place uh, in um, the first um, so-called gay erotic store. Um, I don't know how you say that in, in, in the USA where you can buy videos and all this stuff. Gay erotic shop. Yeah, or yes. an X-rated store or something. So, and this was the exhibition that was shown at that time, or this is the exhibition that was shown at that time. And are those the original drawings that were in that original show? Yes. Yeah. yes. So what, they were taken together for this exhibition now from all the private collections they are in today. So and this was the first exhibition ever in 1976, but at that time, the owners, uh, what at that time, the owners of this um, uh, gay erotic store did not know. They um, advertised it as the first show in Germany, and they did not know that it was the first exhibition ever that took place. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it was very special at that time. And this was, or this is one of the um, aspects that is for this exhibition here. I'm sorry, sometimes my German is a little, my English is a little bit difficult, I'm sorry. And I'm also a little bit nervous because this is new for me too. Yes, but you're doing very well. Don't be nervous <laughs> if your English is just great. Let me just ask you one question and, and I'll, I'll ask a few questions th throughout this. And obviously if you don't know the answer, that's fine. But going back to that first exhibition, do you have mm -hmm. any sense what the reception was like in 1976 for ha having those works on, on the wall? Because some of them are, are quite graphic and quite explicit. And do you have any idea if, if you do about whether it was a positive or ne negative reception or even just whatever? Well, it was mostly when it comes to the mainstream, of course, it was an exhibition that was not recognized at all, because uh, at the, even today it would be difficult to get attention. Um, but at that time it was about uh, homosexuals, so it was subculture and um, going with, how to say it, um, erotic magazines and all this stuff was became just legal a few years before so it was very it was still from the mainstream uh, from the mainstream it i would say it was cons it was not recognized at all because it was dirty you know sure. so nobody wanted to do something wanted to have to do something with it um the gays of course uh, they already knew uh, Tom, because Tom became popular already uh, uh, in the, exactly, uh, all, uh, all over the place. So uh, his drawings have been popular, very, have been popular before. So it was well recognized uh, during the gays that have been in Hamburg, but also it was not, um, it was, it was not common to see something that is gay explicit as art. Mm -hmm. It's still difficult today and it was even more difficult at that time. Mm -hmm. So um, in the catalog that is produced for this exhibition, um, I wrote that they um, ask for prices between 800 and 1200 mark at this time. So uh, even if I would only uh, compare it into euros, what is nearly equal to dollars, it would be 800 to 1,200 1, euros. Um, but compared to what it have, because it's 1976, 
I would say it was more about 1,200 to 2,000 uh, dollars. So I was really surprised by this high price. Yes, so uh, the high price at the time, but, but of course, Today, we know that Tom's pieces sell at auction for twenty to $30,000. Uh, they, they can be that high. And also, it's interesting about you saying the fact that um, it was not considered high art and it was not respected. But now today, uh, the Museum of Modern Art has a number of Tom's pieces in its collection, as many contemporary art museums, you know, very established art museums has have works of his in their collection. So it's very interesting how things have changed, but it's so lovely to be able to see these things from that very first show in 1976. So, but I have to ask you, Hunter, um, do they have also the very explicit ones in Absolutely not. Um, so you can go to the MoMA website and you will see that they, uh, they have them on their website. They are, they are uh, portraits mostly and some full bodies with some pronounced um, 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 penises underneath the pants, but not terribly explicit. So the, some of the work that you're seeing, no, they don't have those in the collection. But, but here in this presentation, we are okay when I show you. Oh, yes. The, of course. Okay. Because, because, as we know, Tom is mostly famous for showing more something like this than... Yes, well, even just to stop for a minute, if you back up just a few, that one, that th this one here with the hairdos is really kind of funny because uh, just a li little bit more to your left, um, uh, there, that one is very funny. I've never seen, uh, certainly the, the, the face in the bottom there uh, definitely looks like a Tom of Finland face, but I've never seen uh, these four faces like this. It almost looks like an advertisement for Lady Clairol or for some kind of barbershop <laughs> or something. I had, I had the same impression when I saw it the first time. So um, about Hamburg, uh, one of his closest friends over time was from Hamburg too, um, Gerhard Pohl, who was a famous photographer uh, after the war. And he became not only one of the biggest fans of Tom of Finland, but also one of his best friends and the first ambassador. He had a big network of business contacts all over the world. And he used every chance to um, to um, to spread the word, to to show Tom's work and all of this, and so he was very important for uh, the recognition of Tom of Finland as an artist. So what we see here is I don't know if you can read it. It's yes. a part of the Pole collection, and he um, he was able to. Uh, to collect over the years uh, during his time uh, he was friend with Tom uh, some of the most um, iconic ones so as you can see yes it's interesting too is looking at these looking at these images I'm reminded of a quote of his before he died um, in 91 I think it was sometime in the late 80s uh, that he he said that his work was not art but he he was very clear he believed his work to be pornography which is very interesting because of course there's an, an erotic element to it but these are these are absolutely gorgeous pieces and I believe most of what we're looking at here are done in pencil yes yes these are all I I just check how good my camera on the Mac is so maybe you can Oh, it's very good. Yeah. yeah, it's very good. The shading, the sh shading in those and the folds and the leather are re really astonishing. As you know, I'm, uh, I'm not coming from a, from a art, from a, a art university background. Uh, my background is communication. So I can't say much about um, the, art historian quality of this work. Um, <clears throat> but what I can say is about the influence Tom of Finland had on the gay community. Uh, when he did all these works, I mean, uh, some of these works are from the 60s, not some, I guess, maybe all of these works here are from the 60s. 
So um, I mean, this is now 50 years ago. And at that, at that time, of course, there have been already the typical places like the woods or uh, toilets or something like that, where you could have sexual meetings. But what he's still doing here or did at that time is to create a kind of um, utopia, a kind of utopic view, how, how it should be in the end. And what I find very interesting is that it became a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy when you look nowadays at uh, the guys that are typical on Grindr or something like that. Most of them do look like straight out of a Tom of Finland book. So, yes, there's no question about that. I think, you know, the other thing about his influence, which is really, uh, to me, quite profound, a, a good friend of both yours and mine, Robert Richards, um, used to say that uh, uh, Yves Saint Laurent, Bridget Bardot, and Tom of Finland were the three most important fashion influencers in the 20th century. And um, Robert used to, used to talk about the impact that that Tom had on male fashion, not only just our clothes, but our bodies as well too. And when you think about how the the gay male clone look or look, look d developed in the 1970s and the 1980s and 90s, and even today, if you uh, today in 2020, you just go down the street and if you happen to see a straight bar with a lot of young men there you would have thought those were gay men 20 or 30 years ago, even though they're straight, because, because there is, a, there is a, a pride that they have and their, and their physical appearance and their adornment and their, their musculature and the way that they express it through their clothes. It's, it's usually very tight and uh, it's a way of actually showing um, hyper-masculinity in a very confident way. And I think that is one of the things that Tom certainly has g given people. Yeah, and I think it's also um, one of the things that made him so popular mm -hmm. because he is not coming, definitely, in my opinion, it's mm -hmm. just my opinion, he's definitely coming, not coming from, a, from an art background as an artist. He, um, he, um, and you can see in his drawings that he is driven by his passion, yeah. also by his sexual arousement he might have had during the draw during he did the drawing. So you really can feel it. And um, what is not there in all of his pictures, it's it's not there. It's a kind of shame. There is no shame. There is no guilt. Um, there is no, I'm feeling bad for that, what I am thing, you know, um, it's, I mean, I mean, I mean, imagine he shows, he shows the guys in the woods or something like that. But, um, when you look, for example, dark room, when, when we now, when we talk about dark rooms and all this, why is it dark room? It's always a dark room and it's dirty room. And it's the only place where we can go something like that or the toilets, you know, that has, that are not the places you're looking for when, when you would do something that is accepted, you know? So, um, but in his case, everything is, is like, like it should be mm. like, like, what is the pro there is no problem at all you don't even think about it you don't even think about oh my god it's gay you know you you just you just think about interesting it's kind of uh it's kind of looking into um a culture of a tribe or something like that mm -hmm. and that is very very fascinating and i guess this is the reason why it, meanwhile generations of gay men can respond can connect with this kind of art in my opinion as i said i'm coming from a communication background so uh, no, no that that makes awful that all makes very good good sense i agree with, with you on all that stuff and also what's nice is to see 
I hadn't thought about it this way, but it's nice to see the number of smiles on his subjects' faces as well, too. And, and of course, some of them are there for some kind of erotic, the smile is there to, for some cases for erotic pleasure, but also it is this sort of lightness and this glow that you're describing that he is trying to present to people, that they're just simply happy being in a situation which is meaningful to, to them and they're not having to, to hide. And so I, th I think that's very, very astute. Yeah, and when you imagine when he started to do uh, this work, um, there was no gay pride at all. There was, uh, it was not even for um, like physical pictorial, it was not even really allowed in the beginning to, to, uh, to produce something like that, to, to ship something like that. Um, so you had to hide it. Yeah. Uh, behind uh, behind something like oh it's about physic uh, health and all this stuff you know so um, something that was certainly something that happened in Germany as well too that a lot of gay and erotic uh, uh, magazines were under the um, uh, under the banner of health and fitness like Sasha Snyder's work I think about that work as well too and he of course did a lot of work in the 30s and the 40s but you know you go back to something like this that this one was published in spring of 1957 well in this country the McCarthy era was still very much in play here the the lavender scare was going on um, there is there's actually no genitalia in this entire uh, br brochure um, there's certainly hints of it um, and certainly the readers knew what this was about and certainly the publishers Bob Miser knew what this was about but I suspect that this was actually this was actually before the big Supreme Court case in the United States, one versus, um, I forget the other name, but it, that was probably 1958 or 1959. So these were sent out in the mail and you did run the risk of being, until that case was decided in the United States, you ran the, the risk of being in pr prison for either sending out or uh, owning these kind of things. Yeah, and this is, this I find amazing that he still, was already at that time, he didn't felt any guilt, you know, that, uh, that was uh, amazing. And uh, later, um, I learned also during the catalog of Galafiuddin, I learned that in the beginning, he used a lot of backgrounds, like I said, like the woods or the bars or something like that in his pictures. And later he became more, more like um, pinup. Um, with white backgrounds and just presenting uh, the guys uh, on their own. So he focused, you no, know, he, how to say it, he intensed the iconic, the iconolog iconology, sorry, I don't know the word. Iconog um, uh, iconographic. Iconographic, um, uh, into, so that he didn't need the background anymore. Mm -hmm. So here we have uh, templates for, as I learned, the U.S. Tom Saloon branch mural. I hope you see something. Oh, yes. These are beautiful. The, these are later in time. It's 77 already. So also the pride of the gay culture crew. Beautiful. And when you see, when you see this, when you, when you look at the faces, um, I think you, uh, you're breaking there. There you go. Now you're back. You were I'm break back again. Okay. You're back. You're, you're good. Okay. These guys, these two guys, for example, you could easily meet this kind of guys every Friday in the in the Berghain. So <laughs> that I find very in, uh, interesting that you that you have a, a look that is that was very hip at that time and that is still work that still works today. Mm -hmm. So I find that yeah, very iconic then in the end. Yes, I love your point about the idea that he was able to get rid of the background and the environment because it was truly his work which had become so iconic that he needed no situ for him to put that work into. It was just simply about the work itself and they, they spoke so much. What years are, are these? Um, these are now from 
this are uh, uh, here now the 80s these are from the 80s the, the before have been from the 70s yep. and these are from the 80s And just to remind everybody, if you're just joining us, uh, I'm Hunter Ohanian, and I'm the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archive here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we are doing a tour of the Tom of Finland exhibition at uh, Gallery Juda in Berlin. And uh, our host here is the former creative director for uh, Bruno Grimunder Books, um, Misha Goransky. Um, Misha, how long is this exhibition up for? Um, the exhibition is only till the 19th now. It already, it's, it's nearly at the end uh, now. It, I, don't, I don't even know when it started. Two months ago, I guess. And yeah. it will close at the 19th of uh, this month. So um, I'm, this is the reason why I'm so happy that I could at least show you um, the, the exhibition. What we just saw with the, um, with the art, um, what I find also, again, from more from the communication side, that his work is very well, um, you, can't, you can't really say where Tom of Finland starts and gay culture ends, or Tom of Finland ends and gay culture starts, because it's very uh, put together, so it so for me, the quality of his work is not so much in his talented uh, drawings, of course, but more in the fact that he did it and uh, the way he did it and what he has shown to the world or what he is showing to the world. And I mean, you, you say that that it's in the uh, that it's in the big museums and all of this, but I I personally do not know if they are. I, I I'm happy that they are there, but I do not know if they are there for the right reason. You know, um, it's I I always have you know me a little bit. I always have a little bit of problem when it comes to the point that heterosexuals are the deciders about gay culture. Um, and I always feel a little bit difficult about that. I'm happy that, it, that they like it, but do they really like it or are they doing it because some of us have been in, in, in important positions and made it happen, you know? Yes. So yes. we will see what the future brings. Well, that's true. And, uh, you know, I, I think they did hang, my memory is they did, when they first bought them, when M MoMA first bought them, they did hang them for a while, but I don't know that they've shown them that, that often. And, and I think it would be, well, I mean, an another case in point is the big contemporary museum in um, Los Angeles about 10 years ago did a show on Tom of Finland and Bob Miser, but they did it in the smaller space, which they don't even have anymore, that was closer to West Hollywood as opposed to put it in the main museum. And so it does get ghettoized in that particular way. And so I think your point is a good one. And I think it's, it's a balance. You know, today, I think we're trying to be far more inclusive across the board. Everybody's trying to be more inclusive, whether it's race or gender or where people are. But simply because people take those steps doesn't necessarily mean that they like it. So in many cases, it's because they feel that they have to. And mm. I think that that's exactly your, your point. We, we certainly see that in the art world here. Uh, well, and I would also say is, I mean, you, we, can, we can do whatever we can do. Gay culture will always be a subculture. Mm. We are not 100% uh, of, uh, um, of, uh, uh, of, of the people. So we are just a um, small group. So it's totally understandable that the interest in it is also uh, smaller than when it comes to more bigger phenomena. So, um, um, and this we should have always in mind when it's about when it's about why is there not so much to see or why is it not so well recognized or something like that. During my time as creative director at Pronogmünde, 
um, I met a lot of artists who expected to become um, a really, really big artist. Mm. And I had to tell them, of course, it can happen. But I told them that because of the Zichet they took to work in, they are talking to uh, already a small audience. And it's also the, the gay culture is deeply connected with uh, sexuality. And sexuality is, um, let's say, complicated thing for the mainstream. And people don't want to be pushed too often into big dicks or something like that, or mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So um, I can understand why there is often some distance. So, um, uh, a third, as I said, he, uh, he had very well good connections to Hamburg, first with the first exhibition, second with his first ambassador and very good friend Gerhard Pohl. And the, the third group um, or the third friends uh, that are connected with Hamburg deeply um, is the, are the, um, I forgot what's their name, just a moment. I had to, Tangermann and Down. Tangermann and Down has been a couple uh, in the six, 70s, I guess, um, who um, had a um, background of business, so they had enough money to, uh, to do a lot of businesses, especially in the gay world, like a bar or, um, or like, what is it called, sauna? In Germany, we say sauna. What is it called in sauna? The uh, same. Or a bit, so, sauna or a bit bathhouse. Okay, bathhouse and all this. And uh, um, they became the first, um, how to say, mat-de-medzin, people who are paying an artist, who are helping the financial. Okay, patrons. Patron, yeah, patrons. So in, in Germany, we would say uh, medzin, ein medzin. And um, they helped him a lot. And so he did a lot of uh, drawings for, for murals in the Tom's uh, in the Tom's saloon, for example, and these are from. Oh, there is no. Just a moment. No, there is no sign from when these are, but I guess these are from the early seventies. But I don't know in the moment, so don't take my word for granted. <laughs> And in the sauna, there was a big mural where this drawing did this drawing. And this was as a big mural in, on the wall of the sauna there. Hmm. When you, let's stop here. Let's stop at that. Let's stop at that image for a second. Go back to that, uh, go back to that drawing in the sauna. Can we go back to that? Yes, to, to the, this one. So to your eye, as you look at those faces, um, those faces and the haircuts and the styles look very American to me. They look very, the, the heads look very clean cut American. Do you see those? Uh, do you see a nationality associated with those faces and hairstyles? Do they seem more American or more G German or even Finnish or e any nationality? Um. Well, I have to say I'm a German, so I'm very raised as a typical uh, American focused person. So um, for me, um, they do not look German mm. in a way. Um, they, um, they look for me like what I usually say Westerners, yeah. uh, typical Western people. And he's, he's showing different, different types um, of a man, also black man, and uh, from blonde to brown hair, and also more, I would say more South, so Italian or something like this. But they all look more like a typical, well, for me, for me, they look like uh, one of my favorite 
TV shows that I watched as a y very young child. Ships, I don't know if you know ships. Oh, ships, uh, oh, yes. The California, California Highway Patrol. Oh, I forget the guy's name. Who was the, uh, was it Estrada? It was, uh, he was uh, Hispanic. Uh, but oh yes, he was very handsome and he looked like all of those people. Yes, and I didn't know at that time when I, 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 I knew that I loved it. I knew that I loved it. Um, it was never shown in Germany, but my sister is from America, so I visit there always during summer. And so at that time, I was about uh, 10, 10, 11. Um, I did not know what, what was the reason that I really loved it. And it was this, this more, um, what was his name? I think it was Eric Estrada. Somebody will somebody will know it and look it up for us. But I do think it was Eric Estrada was his name. Uh, he was very handsome at the time, and he yeah. looked great. He looked like six foot. Two. He looked like one of those figures, one of those characters. Yeah. So so it, it's uh, and also later uh, later in no at the same time I guess there was this uh, Tom Selleck Magnum. Oh yes. And, uh, and he definitely. Uh, I mean. Do we have someone? No, they are all they are all younger than Tom Selleck and Magnum. So, yeah. uh, but it's there is definitely a connection, I would say, yeah. and uh, so that I find it very fascinating. Also, what I what, what I was reading uh, in the catalog is that Tom of uh, Finland bought his first porn magazine uh, in Hamburg. Hmm. In when was it? Uh, 1952, mm. uh, 53, something like, or 51. Um, he bought his first porn magazine. And I found it very funny because um, when I was 20 years old, I bought my first porn magazine in Hamburg too. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I, found it very, I found it very funny. So uh, he would have so, been he would have been thirty. He was born in uh, he was born in nineteen twenty. So he would have been thirty one in in fifty one, which is interesting. Do you know whether or not he was ever ever married to a woman? I don't know the the answer to to that. No, no. I uh, he had he had a boyfriend uh, or a friend, let's say it real, a partner in the in the fifties. Yes. So um, so I don't think that he was ever uh, married to a woman and. Depending on that, what I said before, that there is no uh, sin in these pictures, I would say he never thought about that in the first mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. So as I never thought about it, so. <laughs> well, it's interesting too. I mean, he also did have a career as well too, he, uh, where he made his money because he wasn't making all the money off these drawings, of course, at the time. But he was a technical dr draftsman as well too. And for those of you who are not familiar, uh, the Tom of Finland Foundation is a wonderful foundation. They're located in Los Angeles, and you can look them up at tomoffinland.org. Um, and uh, Emery might throw that up, up on the screen here as well too. So you have the link uh, to, to that as well too. And everything about Tom is there. And actually uh, the structure that it's in is a house that Tom lived in and owned. He had set, apparently he set the foundation up before he passed away in 91. Um, but it, it's actually the physical place where he lived. Uh, you can see his drawing table. You can see some other things. Um, about him and they have wonderful pr programs. Uh, they have an artist residency pr program. They have drawing groups there. Um, they do all sorts of different exhibitions and sales. And so if you're ever in the Los Angeles area, um, certainly if, if you're interested in Tom's work, it's certainly um, something to uh, spend some t time with. Um, I'm coming now to a picture that is very explicit. So just to tell you right before, Okay, you, you got our attention. Of course, oh yes, this is a famous one. And it's from 74. Uh -huh. I, can't, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't see it with American eyes. So maybe you can, because what I can see is that uh, for me, the guy in the middle would be um, still a white guy in a way it wouldn't i would not call him a latino but the other three guys are definitely black yep. and so i find at all and also the this the explicit sexual um content i find it for 1974 um 
very amazing that this is yeah that it exists yeah well but for, for me um i'm i'm born 1971 so um i grew up with uh tom of finland in that way he was very important for me during my teenager years and my um, when i was in berlin in the mid 90s i had uh, there just Taschen just released a very big Tom of Finland book, and I did a copy out of it from uh, one of these drawings in the woods, and um, I made a really big copy that I put over my bed. So, <laughs> and also for to honor Tom today, I was wearing my leather. I do wear my leather jacket that I bought with twenty one. So. <laughs> I'm still. That's, that's so great. That's so great. It's it's w wonderful to hear about the drawing that you made. How old do you think you were when you made that drawing? Hmm? How old do you think you were when you made that drawing? When I, copied, you mean, you mean, uh, when I, I copied it out of the book, so yeah. um, um, I was this moment. Um, I was twenty three. Yeah. Twenty three. Twenty four. So, um, and the bed, uh, the bed I had was a kind that of, had a name. It's a, a, uh, it's a designer bed, it's still available today. It's called Jailhouse Fuck. It's made out of the <laughs> that gate that, usually, that I usually used in jails. Mm. So um, I was a little young boy, which is, you know, something like that. And of so. course, what you did, what you did by making the copy of, of that Tom work is something that gay men have been doing since the 1950s, since the work first appeared it, and it became public. Uh, when I was at the Leslie Lohman M Museum, we would get many, many, many sheets of different individuals, not, not developed artists per se, but individuals uh, particularly after they had passed on, their family would would donate them to the museum. And there would be all of these wonderful homages to Tom and his work where people would either try to trace them or they would try to draw them. And, and, and their drafting skills were not particularly good, but it was something that about the work that spoke to them so much beyond the eroticism. And I think it goes back to what we were saying before, it's about the joy and, and the happiness and the freedom in the work. It spoke to them so much that they would just make copies of it. It was a way for them to just get more out of the work themselves by being able to participate in participate with the work in that way by copying it. Yeah, it, what, because through through this, I uh, n nowadays I realize that I, that uh, Tom's work. It became, in a way, for me, a kind of role model because, as a gay man, maybe nowadays it's different. I don't; younger people can tell me. Um, but at at my time, there have been not a lot of role models, you know, um, and especially not when you're coming from from the countryside like uh, like I am. So um, when I was a young man, I uh, the only gays I knew. Uh, have been the gays uh, in the TV that mm. are usually, let's say, hysterical. <laughs> but what I what I love nowadays, but at that time I was a young boy and I was very much interested in real men, mm. you know. So and I didn't really connect with um, with guys screaming around or something like that. So I wanted to have um, more like the guys I saw on the street. So when I discovered the work of Tom of Finland, I saw these guys in a way, but more like the perfect version of them. Hmm. So it was what we had before. It was a kind of utopic view. Hmm. And during my work uh, at Bruno Gmünder, um, I realized that um, a core part of gay art or gay culture is always this this view of what how should it be so it's not uh, usually it's not the work how it is but how should it be mm. it's always 
it's always like a little bit like like we are dreaming to go to Oz, you know? Uh, and um, hopefully it works one day. Maybe this is why gays are still have a very dreamy, dreaming feeling of everything. And, and, and also I think I agree with everything you just said, but if you would back up a little bit more and go back to that image directly behind you, the one with the motorcycles, I also think to your point, exactly to your point, so here, yes, of course, they're, they're drawn in typical Tom of Finland uh, style as far as the bodies go, but also what he is depicting here are members of the community in a fraternal sense. These are men who had other friends who were equal to, to them and they're equal, they're equal to, together and they have playmates and friends for them to be able to do what they want to do, in this case, ride motorcycles. And I think that's part of what you were describing about what was missing for some of us in the sense that when we saw other stereotypes, if they were particularly effeminate or this or that, it was hard for us to, to open ourselves up and to have a group of friends that were like-minded at the same time. And, and also to have friends that, that the bond was not necessarily about sex. Here it's about, here it's about two, four, six men who are simply doing a sport to, to get together. It's clear that they're all gay. It's clear that they're par part of a, of a gr group to, to, together, but they simply are just enjoying their time together. Yeah, and it, they do it in a, it could be easily, easily when the picture would be a little bit different, it could be easily a total normal situation. What is also very interesting here, as you can see, Hell's Angel. Yep. I mean, the total new impression of Hell's Angels. Yep. In a way. So um, what I find in that way very interesting is um, I just realized uh, during your, uh, during your, your talk that um, um, I'm currently, I'm very fascinated by uh, game characters in mm -hmm. online role-playing games, and it, be it becomes more and more common that, um, that you can get also in a relation or a sexual relation with the same gender mm -hmm. or with aliens or whatever. So, but the, the quotes, um, the, what they say is still the same way. So when, when, the guy is, when the guy is very masculine, hey, you know, like this, and uh, uh, you try to get to get into a connection with him. So they are still using this, this kind of talk. And it's very, uh, it's, it's very sec it's very erotic when you, when you see that. And so this reminds me as something earlier, but the same as you can. This is from, no, I don't have, no. These are. Look, at the, look at the bell bottoms on those pants. Holy mackerel. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what's interesting about this, of course, again, it's highly sexualized, but by the same token, this is just a beautiful portrait of a couple. Yeah. And, you know, and, and these are just, these can be, you know, your parents. It, it could just be anybody that they're just two individuals who care a lot, a lot about, about each other. Yeah. It could easily be the wedding photos that I just did <laughs> yesterday in a way, in a way, of course. So this is from the series The Woods where I once also did my copy of. So let's, talk, let's stop here for, and particularly since you, you had worked on this piece. So there's clearly, there is cl clearly an aspect of his work in which fetish play comes into the work. And I think in many cases, he was known a lot of that. So for example, we see a lot of the leather in the work and here we see somebody uh, with a whip in the work and, and we have two men or three men wearing chaps and they're wearing boots. Um, what do you know about his, his own personal desire around fetish? And then also why did he incorporate um, fetish into to the work? Um. I have to tell you, I don't, I never, I, I never checked uh, why, why he thinks that he was connected. The only thing I can say, he, uh, he, was, a, he was a young man during Second World War 
and um, his country was invaded by uh, the Germans. Yes. So, yes. and um, the Germans ha had uh, the, had very impressive uniforms. Yes. So, and when he was as a young man, also very attracted by hypermasculinity, um, I would say that his fetish for uniforms is coming from this, this because a uniform is not only um, taking away your, your individuality, it's only giving you a kind of power, strength. Mm -hmm. And so I'm confronted with this in young years. I can understand that uh, this shaped his uh, sexual um, desires. But why it became in the end the letter, I was never really thinking about it. So I, I was never very close with the letter scene. Yeah. So I say something it's, it's also it's also interesting though about you raising the point about Finland having been attacked by the or having been invaded by the the Nazis and that how that probably impacted him if he was born in 1920 and let's say um, I'm going to just m make it up I wish I had the the exact date here but let's say 1935 or 37 um, is when uh, the Germans uh, invaded F Finland. Already, already earlier, uh, already earlier, more 19. Earlier, yeah, e even like 1930 or 1932 or 33, he would have been just a t teenager at that time. And so he would have been at a very impressionable age in which he was seeing those uniforms um, that, that you're speaking of that the G Germans were occupying his country with. Because, um, he, he has to, um, it's, it's interesting because the, the same what we had before that there is no guilt. Also here there is no, you, you, see, you see a kind of punishment, but it doesn't feel like punishment. Um, you don't have the feeling that there, is, that there is pain in the deeper sense involved. I agree that, with that. I agree. You don't really feel the pain being inflicted. And I think, I think he's very successful this way because as beautiful as the drawings are, he does keep them light and they are slightly cartoonish in some way. There's so many round things. They're not quite Mickey Mouse, but they are cartoonish in sort of the classic way at the time. And so it's hard to believe that there is real pain being, being, um, being exerted in these images. So, and then there is also love. Yeah. On a very hyper masculine kind of view. With a, yeah. I mean, but just let's just stick there for a second and just people should appreciate the shading and the white spots in that pencil work, particularly on the nude form there. Look at the thighs and even um, the, the calves and the inside of the um, of the knees and then also on the arms as well, too. They're so incredibly well rendered. Um, and look at the folds and the jacket and the whites in there as well, too. Um, they're, they're just astonishing. But at the same time, he, re he reduced also um, forms when you look at the trees, for example. Um, yes. So it's, it's very, what is not so important, it's reduced. And what is important, it's made perfection. Right. So and here we come back to, here we in the 80s again. And here is this kind of... Um, pin-up style we had before. And again, here we're in that period, as you rightly pointed out, that you know these did not have to be in situ. They, they were simply so iconic by this time that it was clearly that figure in that style that even though, yes, it does say Tom there on the bottom, it, it clearly is his work. Well, we, we should not forget there is also there is also a very practical reason that he, he kept away the background because uh, most of these pictures have been used for, for flyers. Yes. For, uh, and of course, there was no possibility 
um, to, it was easier to have just the figures to put sure. text on it. So, um, and here's a very iconic one. Oh yes. Yeah. And this is very different from so much of his other work. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost um, uh, surrealism to a d degree and it also has a bit of sci-fi in here as well too. And I don't, this of course, everybody is, who's familiar with his work knows this, but I don't know a lot of other images similar to, to this. It's an absolutely beautiful I image. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's outstanding from that what he usually did. Um, I don't know the background of this one, but I'm sure it's an interesting one. <laughs> so, and here he is this master in a way. Right. Yeah. I mean, looks like a young Tom, Tom Selleck. Yeah. And this is this is why why uh, um, not only in the beginning with with uh, physic pictorial, but also later with uh, all these flyers and often this this pirated um, uh, copies um, of his work for flyers uh, um, for gay bars all over the world. I mean. Wherever you go, you you will find something. Um, you somebody used Tom of Finland, uh, legally or not. That this made him very popular in in his or in our community, sure. and this is why he became so important. Yeah, this is um, or this is the exhibition, yeah. and um, I was. Well, I am very happy that I had the chance to show it to you. So um, I hope you liked it. Misha, it's, we are so indebted to you. I mean, particularly with COVID going on, it's difficult for people to travel. And of course this exhibition, uh, I want you to thank our friends at the gallery for being able to allow you to do, do this. Uh, they put so much work it, it, into this. And I think the exhibition did open in August or early September. And of course they have not been able to have that many visitors here to see this work. Um, but I am so grateful that you took the, the time to, to go through the show and to do the re research and to be able to make it, it happen. And we're all, I mean, it's just, it's a wonderful way for us to see an exhibition and, and for us here in South Florida and Fort Lauderdale to be going on a, a gallery tour in Berlin is just fantastic. It's one of the few bright things that have happened through, through this COVID situation. And so um, thank you, Misha. We totally appreciate everything that you've done here. It's just terrific. You're welcome. And if you have another question for another tour, don't hesitate to contact. I would love to show you guys around. Well, that, that would be great. And I did look up and it was Eric Estrada was the guy, was the actor who you were in love with and Chips. And so um, I did see some pictures of what he looks like today. You might want to take a look at a few of those. And, um, and so for, for those of you, um, we're happy to have you all here. Again, I'm Hunter Ohanian, the director of Stonewall National Museum and Archive in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. You can find out everything about Stonewall at stonewall-museum.org. We have two exhibitions up right now. I'm actually in the library right now. We're one of the largest LGBTQ libraries in the world, uh, 28,000 volumes. We have two shows up right now. One is called Queers at Home, which are looking at gay domestic life uh, for over the last 40 years. And so that's really an interesting show. And then also we have a show up now called Life Letters, which are expressions of love between members of the LGBTQ community, um, their parents, families, friends, and, and roommates and so please come and see that. Both of those are available online as well. And also please uh, join us every week when we, we do these uh, virtual talks. They really are great. Misha, again, thank you. Um, I'll be in touch. And uh, Emery Grant, can you show yourself? Uh, Emery's behind the scenes here, De Deputy Director of Stonewall, and uh, he'll pop up there. Hello, Emery. There you go. Thank you for your help here. And um, good night, everybody. Uh, we'll see you all ne next week. So long. Bye.